So, how would you like to be able to take photos of your dog like this one? This is what I would call a portrait of a dog. This is one of my Cavaliers. And uh, it's a portrait because it shows the head and facial expression. It doesn't show the entire body. It doesn't show the dog in action or motion. But there's an awful lot of detail. Uh, there is a, an expression of the dog's temperament and personality there. And there are no distracting background elements. In order to take a photo like that, you do need some equipment. And I think that what equipment you use has an awful lot to do with the results you get. I think you basically have two choices. Both of them are digital cameras. You could use something like this. This is a Nikon DSLR. Uh, for those of you who are not photographers, D stands for, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apple's trying to get up on my lap and she's knocking the tripod around. So if you see any shaking, that's Apple's fault. Uh, the D stands for digital and SLR stands for single lens reflex, which means it's a camera where you're actually looking through the lens when you put your eye to the viewfinder. This is not a high-end, this is a Nikon, and I do like Nikon products. There are a number of good brands besides Nikon, but um, it, it's one that I happen to like. Uh, it also gives me something in common with Paul Simon, aside from the fact that we are uh, both kind of lacking in physical stature. Uh, but uh, if you remember the song Kodachrome, um, it shows that he has a little bit of a propensity toward transparency film, which I always liked before digital came along, and Nikon as a brand. So anyway, um, this particular one is not a high-end Nikon, not terribly expensive. You can buy the body of this camera used in very good condition for probably less than $200, $250 um, from a reputable dealer. Uh, and uh, you'll get perfectly fine results. But the main reason we buy a camera like a Nikon or one of the other high-end brands uh, is for the optics, not for the mechanics so much of the camera. You want something dependable. Uh, the number of megapixels on the sensor here is only somewhere around 10 or 11, so it's not a very high-resolution camera, but the optics are wonderful. The lens that you see mounted on here is a Nikon zoom lens. It's a 55 to 200, which I think is a very nice range for portraits like the pet portrait that I want to take here. And again, you can buy this lens for not an awful lot of money. Brand new, you could probably get it for between two and three hundred dollars, and you might be able to find a real bargain on a used one uh, for maybe a hundred or so. Your other choice would be to use something a little bit more compact like this. This is a Panasonic Lumix uh, camera, usually referred to as a super zoom, called a super zoom because although the sensor is small, it does pack quite a few megapixels and there is just one lens built into this camera and that's it. And just by operating the zoom, you can zoom the, the lens out or you can zoom back in again to wide angle. And the result is kind of dramatic as to what you get. It looks something like this. Now here we are at the wide angle setting. And if I start to zoom in, you'll see I'm getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And it's like, wow, what a huge difference. It's important though that you get something that has an optical zoom as opposed to a digital zoom. A digital zoom takes the image that's on the sensor and uses smaller and smaller portions of it and enlarges those and that gives you a lot of pixelation and loss of uh, resolution. You don't want that. An optical zoom uses the lens to take the image that you have and put it on the full frame of the sensor. So you're not going to lose any quality when you go from wide angle to a, an extreme telephoto zoom. I'm going to use the Nikon to demonstrate my technique for getting these kinds of portraits with your pet. Um, 
and uh, but the same techniques would apply to whatever camera you use as long as it has good optics and an optical not digital zoom you might have a dog that would respond to commands like stay and sit and lie down and if you are lucky enough to have that situation it does make the whole process of taking a good portrait much much easier all of these cameras have um, a setting uh, dial that puts the mode of the camera that you're going to be in i'm going to use the one that's indicated with a P, which stands for program. There's also an auto, which serves pretty much the same function, but many of those autos will also do things I don't want them to do, like pop up the flash when the light is a little low and I want to use natural light instead of a flash. Um, I find P for program is the best overall setting to use on a digital SLR. If I want to try to use a dog that's going to stay put, um, I'm going to try with Bootsy to see because she's been trained and I'm going to see if I can get her to stay put for me. Bootsy, wait, wait. I want to get myself at least 10 or 20 feet away from the dog. I want to get down to the level of the dog. <laughs> I want to get Apple off of me. And then I zoom in so that her head fills the frame and I call Bootsy. And I start snapping pictures. Boots, Bootsy, Bootsy. And of course the wonderful thing about digital is that you can just take thousands of pictures and it's not gonna cost you. The old days when we used film, I could go through like $100 worth of film and processing in no time at all and, and still not get too many good pictures. I'm also dealing with dogs like Apple, who would not stay still because she's only nine months old and she's not as well trained as Bootsy. So with a dog like that, I'm going to have to get her attention a different way. So I will use one of her toys. I will throw it away from me to get her at the proper distance. And then as she's turning around, I'll try to capture her coming back to me. Apple, get it. Apple. 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 Hey, Apple. Now, something to realize is that there are various types of lighting you can use. If you have a sunny day like today is, you can use direct sunlight in the dog's face if you do that, the advantage of the direct sunlight, it creates really rich colors. It creates a lot of good contrast and shows off the sheen on their coat. And um, it also gives you a lot more detail. However, if you have a cloudy day or if you're using a shady area, you can use uh, the cloud cover to give you a softer look and uh, you don't have to worry about glare in the dog's eyes or anything like that, or even lens flare if you're facing into the sun. If you do face into the sun, you can use backlighting very effectively. What the backlighting does is on the dog's face, it's gonna give you a, a, something similar to what you would get on a cloudy day or an overcast situation or shade situation, but uh, it will highlight almost like a halo-like appearance around their head. So let's take a look at some photos. You just saw me take this one of Bootsy when she was sitting on the chair. Because we're focused on her with a long lens, the chair is not a distraction at all. All we're looking at is her expression. And the face is sort of flattened so we don't see any length of muzzle or anything, just her expression and the nice reflection in her eyes. This next one was um, Apple when she was standing on the ground after chasing the ball that I threw. Again, no distracting background. The grass is out of focus. We just see her features uh, in nice, sharp contrast and nice reflection in her eyes as well in this one. And then the third one you saw me take. This is, again, Bootsy, but this is with backlighting. Notice 
the, the brightness of the edges of her coat uh, as opposed to the uh, mellow lighting on the front of the face. Now, in all cases, they were not groomed for this. I would have normally groomed them if I were doing a nice portrait. Here is one I took a little while ago of Apple. And I did groom her for this, so she's combed out nicely. Direct sunlight, so I get beautiful, rich colors and a lot of fine detail in it and great reflections in her eyes. This is one of Boo. And again, the, the background is not a distraction. It's totally out of focus. We can just look at her features in kind of a side light, direct sunlight uh, situation. This is Jambo when he was a little puppy. And he was in a shaded area, so we get more of a flat lighting effect. Uh, again, we had some highlights that we could uh, reflect in his eyes, so we get some nice detail. This is another puppy we had years ago, and uh, she is uh, backlit here. And you'll notice that nice halo effect on the back of the coat there, on the back of her head, and nice highlights in her eyes as well. This is a dog owned by a friend of ours who's another breeder. And uh, again, it's a very nice study with excellent backlighting. I, I love that strong effect of the sun on the back of the dog's head. Here's a Ruby who was backlit. I think I probably used a flash here to get that highlight in her eyes. Uh, background colorful goes with her coat color and totally out of focus so it doesn't distract. And then we have, here's a nice study of a black and tan boy of ours. This is Dylan. Um, this is kind of a side lighting situation, so we get a little bit of contrast to show the texture of the coat on his ears and the top of his head. And finally, this is a girl who's no longer with us, Derby. And uh, that's the one we started with. Front lighting situation, beautiful background out of focus. So I hope that helps all of you and good luck to you in taking photos of your dog. And I hope you can use some of this information for that.